So less a less a presentation, more of a just uh, a quick run through some of the results that, that you get out of Maxent. Um, not all of them. You'll you'll have already seen that there are a ton of results files that, that you get out. But what I'm going to do is just spend a few minutes pointing you towards the most important ones and the ones that we've kind of um, <coughs> covered, if you like, in, in, in the last few days. So this is not exhaustive of, of the information that you get out of Maxent, but this is pointing you towards the the key things. Um, so this is what we did yesterday. You remember that we, we, we loaded in our approach records for the, for the elephant and, and, and the lion. We loaded in the present day environmental variables. The model is going to build an association between those two. We asked it to re create response curves. I'm going to show you what those are in a moment. We asked it to create um, pictures of the predictions. We didn't do the jackknife of, of variable importance at the moment. We can talk through that um, uh, if, if you like, but for now I'm just going to stick to, 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 to the, the more standard things. Um, there are a number of output formats you remember, um, and I, I said basically these are old versions of cumulative and raw, and there aren't many good reasons for using those these days, so we really just need to focus on, on the logistic output. Um, the details of, of, about that are in, uh, I think, a 2008 ecography paper that Stephen Phillips um, led that you, you've got in your references. Um, we're going to output the file type of ASCIIs, and we set the output directory, of course, and you remember that we created a folder called um, results number one. And then the other thing we did was set a projection layers directory. This was the directory that holds, in our case, future climate scenarios for the, the 2050s. Remember, it has exactly the same set of environmental variables in as we have in the present day. But that's where if you're doing, say, invasive species or something, you, you put in your, your area that you want to project the model into. So for the example I'm going to give you tomorrow for, for, for uh, plants in, in South Africa, then we would be projecting to other parts of the world. And it's in this projection layer that you put the other parts of the world um, in there. And then under settings, again, there are a whole bunch of things that you can change. But all, all we did was change the, uh, the random test percentage, that was that percentage of, of, of points that we were going to pull out of the model to use for testing. What we'll show you in a moment are the evaluation statistics that are calculated based on that random test percentage. And then I suggested that you have a play with the regularization um, parameter um, to, to see how that affects your results. Again, there's, there's a lot more there, but those are the things that we were going to cover right now. And we hit run. I'm not going to do that now. It took a few minutes. It didn't take too long. Um, but that's, in effect, where we left it. So, so what's it What's it given us as results? Well, I've gone to my file, file browser, and I've, I've found my results um, folder. And then there are a number of, of files here. And we're just really going to focus on a couple of them for now. Um, Firstly, here's your ASCII grids. You've been using ASCII grids for the other models that we've, that we've played with. Um, you've learned how to import those into uh, QGIS and visualize them. Um, that is just your, that is your maximum prediction. That is your grid that gives a prediction, a, a, a logistic um, probability prediction in every single cell in, in the landscape where, where you have environmental data. And we'll, we'll see a picture of that in a minute. But that's the one that you could import into QGIS. We've also got here a, a basically identical file but the values are for the 2050s. So this is the projection. You'll see it's named uh, very obvious. It's, it's got the species name and then it's just tagged on the name of the folder that was used um, for those scenarios. So if, you, if you're trying to do this and project a, a different region or to a different scenario, then you call your folder in you know, the 2050s or, or Asia or whatever you're projecting to and that will get tagged onto your, onto your file name. The other thing that I want to look at now, which is basically a summary of all the other results, is a HTML file, um, which is you know, just a species name, HTML. And you'll see that all of this is replicated both for the, um, for the elephant and, and for the lion. It's just exactly the same for the two species that we modeled. And if you modeled 100 species, you'd have this 100 times, all within that one results folder. So let's have a look at this HTML. And, and it talks you through it, and, and we've 
pointed you towards the tutorial that you can that you can download. Um, what's that actually on the thumb drive? I'm not sure if we have the tutorial on the thumb drive, but you can download the, the latest version from, from the website that we pointed you towards. Okay, the, the, there is the Stephen Phillips' tutorial. It, it takes you through all this in, in detail, and all I'm going to do is point out the main things that I want you to, to look at. So this is this is for one of our two species. We're, we're not going to work with the first graph now. We're going to have to focus on the second graph. This, these are your, um, this is your ROC, your receiver operating characteristic curve, okay? Um, we talked you through that this morning, Terry talked you through that this morning, what the uh, ROC curve is, remember you're plotting sensitivity against specificity, in effect it's a, uh, a balance of how well you're doing on your positives and how well you're doing on your negatives or, or your, your presences and your absences. Remember, in this case, the absences are really background points; they're not real observed absences. But this is your this is your ROC curve. So this is your, um, if you like, random prediction, your one-to-one -one line. Remember, we're going to measure the area under the curve. So if it's a random prediction, you're going to get about we're going to get 0.5. If it's better than random, you're going to get a value between 0.5 and one. And you've got your two curves here. One of these is for try and get that all on the screen. The red one is for your training data. So your 80% of the data in the way that we run the model. And the blue one is for your test data. And the blue one really is the important one. Because the, the, the training data is just how well the model could fit to the data that was used to, to, to calibrate the model, to train the model. So the test data really is your key one. But notice that the training data is more up towards that top left as we're looking at it than the um, test data. And again, that's the difference. This is, this is the, the fact that the model can fit better to the training data that it sees, that it's built on, rather than the test data. So you would expect, you know, getting the, the kind of result that we would expect, a better um, ROC curve for the training data than for the test data. But that's, that's to be expected. And the difference between these two, if you have a really huge difference, that, that would, you know, in effect say that you were overfitting. If your if your training data fit really perfectly and gave you an AUC, AUC score of about one, uh, then um, you would fit very well to your training data. But if your test data was very poor, was a, a much closer to the one-to-one -one line, then that that difference between training and test would show that you're doing really well on your training data, but the model can't generalize very well. To, to the test data. So again, going, you know, it, it may take a little bit of time to really get your head around how these, these curves work. Um, uh, and the town's given some caveats about the interpretation, but this is what you get out of the model. This is, you know, this is just presenting this information very clearly. So you get your actual curve, but the key numbers, or the key number really, is this one here. That's your actual AUC score for this particular species. So when you see presented in a uh, presentation, or, you know, in a, in a publication, or a thesis or something, this is kind of your key number. Now, that comes emphasize some reasons why we have to be careful in the interpretation, but this is one of the standard metrics that you will see, and there it is, and has caveat, but that's definitely one that you want to know and have in your write-up and, and be able to, to refer to it. Is your kind of standard measure of, of predictive performance of, of the models. Any questions on that? Okay, so the next um, the next key thing to look through is, is this table here. Um, these are the this this tells you a number of interesting things, but these this tells you about thresholds and it tells you the model performance at a particular threshold. So remember that the, the AUC score that we've just looked at is a threshold independent, independent measure. It doesn't, um, it doesn't depend on setting a threshold. Well, these are the, the, the binomial and, and, and um, uh, success rate tests that, 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 that Taryn talked about this morning um, that depend on having a binary prediction of, of present or absent. So what are we seeing here? Let me just talk you through the table so you can really understand what the model is, is telling you. So these are your thresholds, these two left hand columns are your, are your actual thresholds. Now remember, um, going back a few years, we only had cumulative thresholds. That's really been superseded by logistic thresholds and that's all we're going to be interested in 
um, right now. So don't worry about this left-hand column. So this is the actual threshold value based on a certain criteria. Okay? And we're only really going to focus on probably three of them right now. There are a number of other ones, but the three that we've talked about in, 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 in our um, discussions yesterday when we talked about, talked about thresholds. So one is this idea of the minimum trading presence. Now, I wonder, a slight logistical issue here with the way my computer's interpreting the screens. But remember, yeah, here we go. Um, Remember back to, to my talk yesterday where we, we had this plot of this threshold along the bottom and then the emission rate on, on the side. This is assuming the presence only data. So as we increase the threshold, the amount of suitable area that we're predicting as present shrinks, right? Which means that our emission rate, the number of presences that are correctly predicted, increases. Okay? So we can, remember we can take various thresholds here, but one of the clearest ones is, well, I, I gave you a few names for it, and, and, and on this figure it's, it's the LPT, or the lowest presence threshold. In Maxent terminology, it's usually called the minimum training presence, just same names for exactly the same, the same thing. But this was the point, this is kind of the, the smallest area that you can predict that doesn't omit any of your points. So it's the, 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 the value, the, predicted, the lowest predicted value that's associated with one of your training occurrence records. Okay. So that, that was what we talked through yesterday, and, and that's one of the values in this, in this table. And what I'm also about to show you is one of the other ones where, remember, we said, well, let's set a particular emission rate. Let's say we set 20% emission, or we set 10% emission. This was this idea of, of, of E that, that Enrique and Town talked about, where we accept a certain percentage of our points might be um, a rogue, if you like. There might be points that we're willing to, to accept as, as, as errors, we're willing to omit from our prediction. So we would read across here and we'd say, well, let's accept 10% emission, come across to our emission rate and say, well, at what threshold do we get 10% emission? What's the threshold at which we omit 10% of our training localities? So those are the two thresholds that I talked through theoretically yesterday. Let's go back to the max end output. Um, those are these two values in your table here, the minimum training presence and the 10 percentile training presence. Okay? So this is saying that at a value of 0.098, and the actual value itself is difficult to interpret and there's no need to worry about that, but at that particular value, if you go to QGIS or NEGIS and threshold your value, you will select the minimum area that doesn't create any emission. So it will shrink as closely as possible to your occurrence records. Likewise, if you increase that threshold, remember you're therefore going to shrink the area, you're going to start emitting some of the points, if you increase that threshold to 0.259, you will omit 10% of your occurrence records. Right? So you can go away then, you can take those values, you can import them, uh, you can reclass your, your, um, uh, your prediction, that ASCII file that was the prediction, it was a continuous prediction. Uh, you can reclass that to these thresholds and you will see that you will omit 10% or so of your, of your calibration records. And I emphasize that's of your calibration data. Remember, setting thresholds we talked about yesterday because it's part of model calibration. You use your calibration records to set the threshold. Okay? Now, if you want to find the 5% emission rate or the 20% emission rate, afraid you need to go and do it yourself. It's not rocket science to do it, but you need some code or you need to look at your results. You can really even just do it in a, in a, in a spreadsheet. And, and find those emission rates. But this is telling you two of the kind of standard ones that are most frequent. 